This podcast is for general informational educational purposes only and is not to be considered medical advice for any particular patient. Clinicians must rely on their own informed clinical judgments when making recommendations for their patients. Welcome everybody to another episode of PHM from Pittsburgh. I am still your host, Dr. Tony Tarcici, Mehmed Peds trained pediatric hospitalist here at UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh in the Paul C. Gaffney Division of Pediatric Hospital Medicine. If you're new, welcome to the podcast. Glad you could join us. If you're a returning listener, thanks for coming back. We are here today in our third episode this month. It has been a busy month for me to talk about a very important topic, a topic that we're seeing more and more of, unfortunately, and a topic that affects all of our patients very, very much directly. Uh, We're going to talk about food insecurity. Now, I am not an expert, as you all, if you listen, know this. I'm not an expert on social determinants of health and factors that impact social determinants of health in children. So I like to bring people on who can help me with these episodes. And I could think of no better guest than my guest for this week, Dr. Laura Panko. Dr. Panko is an assistant professor of pediatrics with the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. She's also a pediatric hospitalist here at the Paul C. Gaffney Division of Pediatric Hospital Medicine, one of my partners. She's board certified in pediatrics and pediatric hospital medicine, and her clinical interests include feeding problems in infants and children and aspects of pediatric nutrition. In addition to her inpatient duties, the prior clinical role she had was in being a physician team member of the UPMC Children's Hospital Pittsburgh Feeding and Swallowing Center Multidisciplinary Outpatient Clinic, where her involvement in food insecurity screening began. So, Laura, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me today, Tony. Well, let's get right into this. So we're talking about food insecurity. So before we get into the details and specifics of the research and what it's shown, let's can we just define what food insecurity actually is? Absolutely. So, you know, food insecurity, I think very simply can be defined as the limited or uncertain access to enough food. Um, if you look at some of the, um, the literature, it can be defined on a couple of different levels as well. You know, some studies have shown that they they define that food insecurity at the individual level is the inability to meet food needs at all times in socially acceptable ways. And they also define it as at the household level when there are multiple members in a family or household as the lack of access for all members to have enough food to lead active, healthy lives at all times. And access to food, it's a social determinant of health. And social determinants of health are defined, they're defined as conditions in which people are born, grow, work, live, and age, and the wider set of forces and systems that shape the conditions of daily life. We're, we're all familiar with um, social determinants of health, even if we haven't, we, even if we can't define them exactly. So I think a couple other examples would be, you know, access to appropriate health care services, transportation. You know, some populations um, have more exposure to, you know, crime and violence that impact um, their ability to live and, and, and be healthy. Thank you, Laura. I mean, we had, uh, I realized on the podcast, we've been introduced to social determinants of health last at the Racism in Medicine series we did. So that's another one. So this is great. So we're, we're really starting to march down the social determinants of health, which I think is good. Now, before we get into the specifics of food insecurity in terms of literature, in terms of hospital medicine, can we talk about its epidemiology and its prevalence and maybe bring up how the prevalence has shaped or changed due to the pandemic? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. I think that, you know, there there are a number of of risk factors for food insecurity. Um, So a a few of these would include, you know, household incomes near or below the federal poverty line. Um, There's a lot of documentation in terms of what um, household income and and it's based on household income and the number of um, members of each household. Risk fact, other risk factors include households uh, it, that are located in urban and rural areas, parents who are uh, unemployed or underemployed, uh, lack of insurance can also be a risk factor, 
um, medical illness or, or chronic medical conditions, uh, minority race, um, particularly individuals of African American, Latinx, and American Indian descent or populations who have higher rates of food insecurity. And then single parent households too, particularly when the head of the household is female, are at risk for, for food insecurity as well. A, an easy place to, if, if people are, are curious, a good, good place to find food insecurity data is the Feeding America website. And they look and calculate food insecurity data on local, regional, and national levels. Um, so, you know, a pediatrician who practices in Cincinnati um, can look at local and regional data there, as can, you know, say a pediatrician who practices in Las Vegas. So it's, it's a nice, easy, user-friendly website. And according to Feeding America, um, pre there was, they had pre-pandemic national food insecurity rates for children that were last calculated in about 2018. And the national data showed that about 15% of children um, were food insecure. So you know, about one in seven kids um, lived in a household where food at times was not plentiful. And then, you know, as an example, you know, with us living in Pittsburgh and in the state of Pennsylvania, you know, our county and state data are pretty comparable to the national data. So in Allegheny County, where Pittsburgh is located, the rate of food insecurity is about 14%. And then for the state of Pennsylvania, it's about 15%. You know, I think a lot of us, the media has definitely focused on this. You know, we've, we've seen a lot of long lines um, at food bank distributions that are just, you know, hard to see. And the Feeding America site um, has done some projections um, about the effect of the pandemic on food insecurity, both for children as well as um, for adults as well. And they project that nationally as a worst case scenario, as many as one in four children could become food insecure because of pandemic related problems. You know, we, I think, are aware of a lot of adults who maybe have lost employment. I think about uh, the restaurant industry um, where people may be out of work. So there's, I think that we are seeing at this point um, an effect of the pandemic on food insecurity in kids and other house and other households. So the site makes a projection based on rising unemployment and poverty rates. So I think it's just, it really is astounding the number of hungry kids who I think are in our communities. That's what struck me. One in four is a gigantic number. I mean, it, it's just huge. It's hard to comprehend. Yeah, again, you know, it's a projection. Um, but, you know, I, I think that, you know, just given what we're seeing, um, I, I think that there are, are more people who are struggling um, more than ever. That's fascinating. There was a, a recent study by uh, Laurie Bannock in published in 2016, where it talked about food insecurity on the inpatient setting. Am I right? Yes. So, you know, this study was really interesting. So, she analyzed data from the NHANES database. So, you know, a national database that looks at, you know, health and nutrition. And she analyzed the database between the dates of 2007 to 2013. And essentially, she looked at children who were in that database who had been hospitalized at any point in the year that the survey was conducted. So, and her analysis of the data showed that about a quarter of recently hospitalized children lived in food insecure households. She also found that the prevalence of food insecurity increased if the child was a girl, um, was African-American, was Hispanic, was a school-aged child, had low income, or, or was lived in an uninsured household. And that a prevalence ranged between about 29 to 38%, with the highest range being children who um, were uninsured. And to compare that, she looked at children who were not reported as being hospitalized in the prior year, and about 19% of those children were, were identified as food insecure. And what? And she wanted to see of those children who were food insecure also, were they eligible for SNAP benefits or WIC benefits, and then uh, did they know about it? And the fascinating thing to me is she found that a lot of them did not know about it, that the families were eligible I didn't know about or hadn't enrolled. And so she used that time to help enroll them in the hospital, which was a novel concept and idea that I hadn't thought of before, clearly. Yeah, I, you know, I think, I think it's interesting. So that is not an uncommon problem. You know, it, it's, and it could be for a variety of reasons. You know, there are a lot of steps 
for families to apply for SNAP and WIC benefits. And, you know, if a family situation may change, um, so at one point, you know, they may not qualify or may not think that they qualify based on their income. And, you know, they, they also may not realize that, you know, potentially with the change in their social situation, they may be eligible for more benefits through particularly, you know, the SNAP program that may, they may not be aware of. So I think just, you know, with some of the complexities of those programs, that may be one reason why families perhaps we're not receiving the benefits that they um, were entitled to. And we'll probably talk about the benefits of SNAP and WIC closer to the end, but it's, it was a fascinating study and the first thing I had ever seen on inpatient medicine with food insecurity. But since we're talking about it, I'd love to talk about why we care so much about food insecurity, meaning what are the deleterious effects this can have on a growing child? Yeah, I think, you know, there are a lot of people who have studied this in the past. You know, I I think one of the things to realize is that there can be detrimental health effects um, for children that can start even before birth. So women who experience food insecurity, you know, particularly during pregnancy may have a higher weight or obesity prior, prior to becoming pregnant and during pregnancy places them at risk for problems such as gestational diabetes and having children, babies who are born with low birth weight. Things that you see in you know, early childhood, late childhood with regard to food insecurity, children may have lower IQ scores. They've been found to have reduced school success and more behavioral problems. And then they also are at increased risk for mood disturbances, um, you know, such as depression or anxiety in later childhood and adolescence. And, you know, I think in terms of I think we always think, you know, as hospitalists, oh, is this a little bit more of an outpatient problem? Do our our primary care colleagues, should they really be the ones who are focusing on this? But I think that there are some things that we as hospitalists may see in terms of the effects of food insecurity on health. So, you know, younger children who experience food insecurity may have an increased frequency of illnesses. They're more likely to be hospitalized um, in early childhood. And then, you know, looking more in the future, they are at higher risk for developing chronic disease in adulthood and have an increased risk for becoming obese. Though some earlier research may contain some confounders there. There, there was a really interesting study. I don't know if you want if you want to talk about. There's a study in pediatrics in 2019. Yeah, I appreciate you bringing that up because this was done by Margaret Thomas, Daniel Miller, and Taryn Morrissey called "Food Insecurity and the Child Health: Pediatrics 2019, Volume 144." They looked at kids 2 to 17 years old, and after some of the eliminations they had for the study, they had about 29,341 kids, which is a a big number. What I loved about it was in the intro of the study, they really kind of dissected out why they were doing it. They discussed how previous studies looking at uh, food insecurity and how it affected child health were simple regressions, which they felt are likely biased, but how and how much are they biased, nobody can say. It makes it very, very hard. And that goes to what you were talking about, where food insecurity is a, it's like, there's like an ebb and flow to it. Sometimes people make a little more money and have a little more food in the house, and sometimes they have less. And it all depends on what's going on. So, so they decided to do a propensity scoring method, looking at a very large, detailed database. Now, what I once I read that, I don't know what that is. But then they went through and defined it. So it's a quasi-experimental method family, which tries to mimic the context of an experimental design. So they made it as close to an experiment as they could. They compared outcomes among children who differ with respect to the household's food insecurity, but who are alike in all other observable ways. So these kids were the same age, probably the same sex, uh, same race, ideally, lived in the same neighborhoods or the same areas. So all the other confounders, they really tried to eliminate as much as they could. And they used the National Health Interview Survey, which is a very, very, very detailed database having a lot of information in it, making propensity scoring easier to do and possible to do. Now, these kids in these food insecure households, what they found was had worse general health and were less likely to be in very good or excellent health compared to their peers in food secure households matched up for everything else. And they said that they were two to three times higher to have increased ED visits delay medical care because of cost and the need, but be unable to afford medical and dental and mental health insurance. And they were more likely to experience some chronic health conditions, including a lifetime diagnosis of asthma, undiagnosed asthma, eczema, skin allergies, and depression. And then they also quoted a recent study towards the end 
where SNAP participants, which is the Supplement Nutrition Access Program, uh, or what used to be called food stamps, may reduce health care costs by as much as 25% among low-income adults. So they say when you compare this with their data, it suggests that a cost-benefit analysis of these programs on reducing food insecurity and related decrease in ED data. So these patients go to the ED more. They did not find that they are admitted more. But to me, when I read this, one of the things that struck me was this is one of those studies that makes common sense. If you have a family that is having trouble affording food and having trouble making sure there's enough food in the house, I don't know how you're going to ask them to prioritize health care and getting to doctor's visits and picking up prescriptions. Sometimes albuterol, if they have asthma, can be pricey. I mean, it's not a cheap drug to have. So I thought it was a really well done study, but one of those that made when it was done, made common sense. And those are always the hardest to do, those studies where you read them and they seem, oh, that's they seem obvious, but to get to that obvious answer took a significant amount of very detailed work. Yeah, I agree. You know, it can be really hard when you're looking at, uh, when you're trying to determine causality. So I, I really thought that this was an incredibly helpful study to read too. You know, so as, as pediatric hospitalists, right? So when you, when you, you did a really nice summary of that article, Tony, I think that, you know, the, the populations that I particularly think about in the hospital that I worry about um, with food insecurity are, you know, we, we see patients with asthma all the time who are admitted to the hospital, you know, so, you know, I, I think just thinking about that medical problem as a, as a specific example, you know, we are in our hospital and I think in hospitals across the country seeing a lot, a lot of adolescents with, you know, mood disturbance and, you know, mental health problems. So I think thinking about that population as well, I think is a, is a nice reflection of the the study that Dr. Thomas and, and colleagues did. And Laura, you know, I thought of directly when I read this, and maybe you'll, you'll feel the same. I've had countless patients with asthma come in and tell me that they, they couldn't fill their uh, con- controller medicine or they couldn't fill their albuterol. They were in between housing. They just couldn't afford it. And of course, I'd have our social worker see them. But what struck me was I may have missed an opportunity to screen for food insecurity in these patients and maybe have asked the social worker to do directed counseling for that specifically. Now, I'm sure knowing our social workers, they did their job and they did a good job and they did screen for them. But it struck me that I have seen this probably and didn't recognize it. I think it's probably happened to all of us, Tony. You know, I think that, you know, families don't necessarily come in the hospital and say, you know, hey, we're struggling to put food on the table. You know, it's it's not something that I think people readily admit to physicians or other healthcare providers. I think it's one of those problems that unless you ask or know how to ask, families are not going to tell you. And, you know, and I think our social workers are so wonderful and they're so skilled in, you know, looking at and discussing basic needs screening, but, you know, they um, have a pretty high workload and I don't think have the opportunity or the time to ask every family um, all of those questions. So, you know, we'll, we'll ask the social workers to see certain families, but um, they, you know, just may do a basic assessment, but may not uncover the, ex- the extent of the problem. Now, since we're talking about this, uh, we've gone over what food insecurity is and the prevalence of it and how it can negatively affect child health. Can we talk about what a what a hospitalist can do? Because my first thought when I read this before the hospitalist article was, this seems like a general practitioner issue, someone who knows the patient really, really well to, to follow. A hospitalist seeing a kid for an asthma exacerbation, although we just talked about how it could have been helpful, uh, for two or three days may not be the best person to do this. But according to the literature, that may not be true. Is that right? Yeah, I think so. You know, we, we do. We think we see, you know, patient for in their family for just a snapshot in time, right? If you think about in pediatrics, our, our hospital admissions are pretty short, you know, 24, 48 hours, you know, with some of our um, patients with co- complex health care needs, it might be longer. And, you know, we don't have quite the longitudinal relationship with with many clinical encounters over time that a patient has with their primary care provider. You know, I, I do have to say that, you know, I think a, a, though we may spend a longer period of time with a patient and their family than a provider in the office would, right? So if you think about the average visit in an outpatient clinic might be 
15 minutes, could be half an hour if there are a lot of a lot of things to discuss. Um, so to have a family in the hospital for a day or so with us, really I think should be ample time to you know try to identify food insecurity. I think that you know there was an article in the October 2020 issue of Hospital Peds um, by Kristen Fritz and her colleagues, um, and they looked at inpatient screening of social risks. And I think that you know, they had identified, you know, just what I had said in in their article. So, and it helps to reframe, I think, the patient-provider relationship a little bit. So, you know, and they said, and I quote, you know, hospitalization represents a unique opportunity to identify and intervene on identified needs because of the longer time available with each individual patient during hospital admission. And I think that, you know, the other thing that is so unique in this period of time, you know, with the pandemic is that, you know, children are, they're, they're not being seen as frequently by their primary care physicians, you know, because of the, you know, the pandemic. So we've seen studies showing that the rates of um, immunizations have gone down significantly because families aren't seeking care and seeing their PCPs. And so I think that, and then, you know, with telemedicine too, for a while, while I think everybody was getting their bearings, there was less opportunity to, you know, screen for food insecurity that that might have been done at uh, an outpatient visit. You know, I think things are up and running a little bit more for folks now, and so um, providers may have figured out a way to continue with screening um, with you know telemedicine clinic visits. So I think you know we as hospitalists have a really nice opportunity to screen and just because they may not be seen in their um, pediatrician's office uh, as frequently as they had been in the past. So is there a validated measure, is there a validated way to screen as a hospitalist for food insecurity in a patient uh, who's there for something else? There is. So there is, there's something called the hunger vital signs. This is a two question um, screening tool, which is commonly used to screen for food insecurity. So the hunger vital signs was introduced by Hager and colleagues in pediatrics in 2010. This, it is a validated measure. It's the first two questions of um, a much longer governmental U.S. household food security survey. So in Dr. Hager's study, the U.S. Household Food and Security Survey was administered to over 30,000 families with children um, between zero to three years of age in, in the household. The study was conducted in seven different urban areas in the United States. The clinical settings where the study where the survey was conducted included emergency departments and acute and primary care clinics. They found that a little under 25% of families who participated in the study were identified as food insecure. And a positive response to either one of the hunger vital signs questions had a 97% sensitivity and 83% specificity and was associated as well with an increased risk of fair or poor child health or developmental risk. You know, it should be mentioned that the hunger vital signs screen was validated only for low-income families with children under three years of age. But I think that um, clinicians pretty broadly apply it to other populations, and it's it's widely accepted nationally. Um, the, a, the American Academy of Pediatrics has adopted it as part of their food and security screening toolkit, uh, and it was also included in the um, AAP policy statement promoting food and security for all children in, in 2015 that was published by the Council on Community Pediatrics and the Community on Nutrition. I will say that policy statement provides a really nice summary of some common government-sponsored Food, ass- food assistance programs, so things like WIC and SNAP and school breakfast and lunch assistance programs. So if anybody needs a little refresher on those, that, that it's a, a very digestible article to read. And then the two questions of the hunger vital signs are the, as follows. So the first one is, within the past 12 months, we worried about whether food would run out before we got money to buy more. And the second one is within the past 12 months, the food we bought just didn't last and we didn't have money to get more. The screen can be conducted by asking families to answer whether the question is often true, sometimes true or never true. But I think more commonly, the questions are administered with a yes, um, no as responses. But there was a study in 2017 by Dr. Makalarski and colleagues that showed there might be a little decreased sensitivity and specificity for a positive food and security screen. 
screens when you ask for yes, no responses. And I think maybe the reason for that is respondents have a little bit of less of an ability to hedge. So like, yeah, you know, sometimes it's a problem when asked, you know, as opposed to being asked to answer yes or no, which are much more definitive answers. Now, one of the questions we all, we get a lot is uh, these screening tools are great in the research setting, but are they, are they as effective in the real life setting outside of the research setting? Do you, can you answer that? I would say yes, you know, because it's it is a two question screen. So it is it's really quick to conduct. You know, there's there's a little bit of a debate in terms of the best way to conduct the screening. So there are some groups who feel that paper screening is really the way to go, that you you will obtain a more honest response to those two questions if you provide a paper screen as opposed to a verbal screening. But I think that, you know, regardless of how the questions are offered, I think you know, really the way that they are offered is what will promote the most honest answers to those screening questions. You know, so for example, I think food insecurity for many people is associated with negative feelings. So, so things like shame or embarrassment. And so I think that, you know, if you approach the topic with a lot of sensitivity and if you normalize the screening method, I think that that goes a long way to say to families, you know, we we care that you have a problem, we want to help. And I think that that may, in the end, you know, promote more honest answers to the screening questions. And, you know, to contrast that to the that long survey, the household food security survey, where those two questions come from, you know, I think that is an 18 question screen, if I remember correctly, which would take quite a while. So I think that the hunger vital signs um, screen is, is nice because it's short and it can be offered in, in, in a wide variety of clinical situations. Every article I read talking about the screening said exactly what you said in terms of the sensitivity which with people have to approach this. Uh, make normalizing it, making a screening for every patient uh, so we're not discriminating or differentiating between how a patient's dressed or looks or anything else, and just doing it with a sense of sensitivity and caring, and you're just more likely to get a better answer out of it. So I think that's wonderful. Now, uh, just to just to make sure I have this right, uh, that it's a 97% sensitivity and an 83% specificity. And the two questions are, within the past 12 months, we were worried our food would run out before we got money to buy more. Or within the past 12 months, the food we bought just didn't last and we didn't have any money to get more. Is that right? That is right. Yeah. And I think, you know, Tony, they, they had found, you know, when you the reason why they ask over that period of time, over a 12-month period of time, and I think you had alluded to this before too, but you know, food insecurity can be a really dynamic problem. So, you know, if a family is, um, you know, if they have if parents have jobs um, and the income is is pretty good, you know, they may not have problems with food insecurity. But you know, maybe a parent gets laid off, and you know, they're living paycheck paycheck to paycheck, and you know, then. It, it is a little bit, it is more of a problem to keep food on the table. So, um, so that's why we don't just say like, hey, in the past month, have you had a problem? That's why that qu- those questions are, are worded the way that they are. Now, some of the other common barriers to screening besides the provider discomfort are uh, uncertainty of what, what to do if the family discloses a problem and unfamiliarity with maybe your local resources. So once we screen a family positive, I'm, if I'm doing if I'm asking the family and they say yes to any of those questions, what do I do with that? So, you know, I think that, you know, again, if, you know, a family discloses to you, so, you know, clearly they're, they're trusting you, you know, to say that they're having a problem. So I think that, you know, the, the best thing to start is just to respond empathically. And then I think the next step is, you know, I think a lot of us on the inpatient side, if you don't quite know what to do next, if you don't know what your resources are, a lot of us do have, um, you know, social workers who we work with on a daily basis. So, and I would say they're a really rich resource to reach out to, you know, to see how, how best, you know, we might be able to help a family. You know, sometimes they can be helpful in, you know, assisting a family if they, if they don't have WIC or SNAP benefits, you know, sort of get them started with, with that process. Um, sometimes they can, they can help out with, you know, resources that, 
refer them to their local or regional food bank to help in a more timely way with food resources. You know, and that being said, I think that, you know, while social workers are just wonderful, I think that the the other piece really is to know information about your local and regional food bank. Um, I think, you know, giving a family something tangible to help them when they're discharged from the hospital, um, just providing some some information about where they can turn to next is is helpful. Um, and again, the, the Feeding America website that I had mentioned before, where we had talked about the statistics of food insecurity, they have a food bank finder on their website. So you just put in a zip code um, and it'll come up with the, the closest um, food banks for a family. Now, I, I promised we would get back to SNAP. And since we talked about food banks, uh, one of the articles for this podcast, the one hospitalization, are we missing an opportunity to identify food insecurity in children by Laurie Bannock in Academic Pediatrics, Volume 16, Number 5, in July of 2016. She does a really nice job, I think, defining the benefits of WIC and SNAP, specifically those programs. Uh, And she quotes WIC participation has been associated with a number of health benefits, including reduction in iron deficiency anemia and improvements in growth and overall health. And that's for younger children with. Then the SNAP, uh, which is the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, they she goes through some of the literature on that and she discusses that some of the studies previously done on SNAP were not very well done due to limitations of an, an endogenous selection and underreporting of participation. So those not as well done studies, she felt, uh, paradoxically had positive associations of SNAP with obesity, food insecurity, and poor health outcomes, which was a surprise. When advanced statistical methods were used, the SNAP program appeared to have a beneficial effect on food security and child health. And specifically, she quoted, elementary age children who received SNAP showed improvements in math and reading scores. So these programs do help kids when used properly uh, with food insecurity, and then thereby other the other things that food insecurity affects, which again makes total sense. If you have a family with food insecurity and you make it easier and cheap for them to get good nutritious foods, they'll do better. One of the things you brought up that I wanted to quickly touch on is the programs around the country that do this well, because you brought up our social workers, it's a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, am I correct? So it's uh, community health resources, it's social workers, it's physicians and it's nurses. It's not one group because it's such a large problem. It, there has to be a multifaceted approach to try to target it. Is that correct? Yeah, you know, it, it, it's really true. I think that, you know, one, one of the big things is that, you you know, is education. So in order for, you know, a, a robust food insecurity screening program to be set up, um, you know, say at an inpatient institution, you have to educate the staff. Um, you have I think they have to understand the extent of the problem. You know, whoever is doing the screening, whether it's, you know, PCTs on admission or nursing staff or, you know, our wonderful pediatric residents, you know, I think they have to be comfortable approaching this um, problem with patients and families. Because if they're uncomfortable, they're not, I don't think they're not going to ask the questions. And I think, you know, the other problem is if you don't know what to do, uh, that also leads to discomfort. If you don't know how to help, if you end up with a positive response, um, I think people are less likely to, to dive in um, and address this problem too. So along those lines, Laura, what are we doing here at UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh to try to address food insecurity in our population? So we're doing a lot. You know, I think we are really lucky to have a very robust division of community health. They're, they're really involved in, in reaching the community. And there is a, a food insecurity task force here at Children's that is headed by uh, individuals within the is headed by members of our division of community health and it's a it's a great forum for those of us who are doing food insecurity screening projects without throughout excuse me throughout the hospital um, and in you know the hospital based clinics to you know meet we meet on a monthly basis to discuss 
our projects. We run ideas, pass one another, learn about initiatives that are being rolled out in the community. And so I think that here we're so lucky to have that that leadership. So that that's one thing that we're doing. You know, I, I have become involved in food insecurity screening through working with the feeding clinic. You know, I, I would sit there with um, the other members of the team and ask families questions um, every day about how much, how often, you know, a child is eating or feeding. And we weren't asking anything about of the family about, are you having any trouble getting formula? Are you having, you know, is, is your child picky because, you know, you don't offer many different types of foods because you're worried that they're going, you're going to waste food if you offer them something new. You know, like we weren't, I don't, I think we were, we were missing an opportunity there to screen for food insecurity. So that, that's really where I got started with screening in one of the hospital-based clinics and got tied in with our food insecurity task force. Um, and essentially, I think a lot of our um, primary care providers who see patients in our hospital you know, based outpatient clinics, um, universally screened for food insecurity. Um, and there is screening that's done in, in some of our subspecialty clinics as well. Laura, this was great. Uh, this was all the questions I had to ask. Is there anything we missed that we should have covered? No, I don't think so. You know, I, I, I had also, um, we had also initiated a, a project in our observation unit um, here last fall in terms of food insecurity screening on an inpatient, um, in an inpatient setting. Uh, I think that you just empowering people to to learn about food insecurity, learning how to screen families, understanding resources and how to help families, I think is really the, the take home message here. I, I, mean, I couldn't agree more. And I do want to say I really appreciate you coming on the podcast, Laura. This has been wonderful. Thank you very much for taking the time out. Oh, well, thanks, Tony, for having me. It's such an important topic. And I, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to talk with you about it. Before we sign off today, I just wanted to say a couple of things. Please bear with me. First of all, to all my regular listeners of our little podcast, I wanted to say thank you. I hope this year we've brought you content which is educational and helpful and ideally in a somewhat entertaining way. We have made it a tradition here at PHM from Pittsburgh around the holidays to do a fundraising episode for a charitable cause. We're a CME podcast, so we're not allowed to take advertising or money for the podcast, but we can raise money for good causes. Last year, we raised money for the Pennies from Heaven Fund, which is a free care fund at UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, which assists families without health insurance and no means to pay their hospital bill. This year is so different in so many ways. This year has been a bear to say the least. A lot of us in children's hospitals are preparing or already seeing adults due to this huge COVID surge to help offload the other hospitals. A lot of us have been working longer and harder than ever before under very stressful circumstances. We know this pandemic has increased the number of families with food insecurities. We felt the best charity to highlight in 2020 would be Feeding America or your local food bank. Now, many of us have already given more to Feeding America or our local food banks because we've seen the need since April. As our charitable episode this year, I would just ask that if you're able to give any more, please strongly consider doing so. Around the holidays, it would be wonderful if no child or adult goes to bed hungry. Thank you again to my guest, my expert guest, Dr. Laura Panko. And thank you to all of my wonderful expert guests throughout the year for sharing their time and expertise with us. Thank you to the University of Pittsburgh, UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, and the Paul C. Gaffney Division of Pediatric Hospital Medicine for your continued support with this podcast. Happy holidays, everyone. I wish you a healthy and happy new year, and we'll see you soon. Thank you for listening.